Praise the Lord. Many Christians believe in the power of prayer, but they don't pray adequately. The problem is not about you know whether we believe that God works through prayer. We all believe. We've heard tons of sermons on prayers, but we don't pray enough. Why is that so? Because I believe that prayer is a lot of hard work. It's not easy. It's a lot of hard work. We don't always see immediate results when we pray. Sometimes it takes time. You know, we, we need patience in order to see answers to our prayers. So some Christians see prayer as a burden and they don't enjoy prayer. But you know what? God wants us to enjoy our time of conversation with him. He doesn't want us he doesn't want us to feel bored about talking to him. Imagine you know if your spouse feels that you are very boring to talk to, you know, you will you'll not feel good about it, right? Or if somebody says, "Oh, I don't want to talk to you because you're a very boring person," you know, it would be an insult, isn't it? So God doesn't want us uh, you know our conversation with him to be boring he wants it to be enriching and exciting you see Jesus was a man of prayer and what we notice about Jesus is that even when he was extremely tired after a day's work and ministry he would go into the night and pray all night and sometimes he would wake up early in the morning and seek the father's face so the Lord Jesus is our role model for prayer and our Lord even taught us how to pray so this morning let's go back to the first century and listen to the only prayer this is the only prayer that the Lord taught his disciples and this prayer provides a pattern for us today so would you take God's word and turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 13. Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 13 is our text for today. Please do follow your Bibles. Verse 9 says like this. Pray then like this. And Now let's read the Lord's Prayer together. Shall we? Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name let's read together your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil may the lord bless the reading of his word and i have entitled today's sermon as our father in heaven our father in heaven Beginning with this week, we will be doing a seven-week series on the Lord's Prayer, which is based on uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Okay, a seven-week series. Now, this prayer, you know, could also be called as the disciples' prayer. You know, because Jesus gave this prayer as a model for the disciples. So some would say it must be called as a disciples prayer and it is not the Lord's prayer because it was supposed to be said by the disciples because Jesus couldn't have prayed forgive our sins, right? Because he's never, forgive, uh, he's never sinned. You know, some would say that the Lord's prayer in John chapter 13, uh, John chapter 17 rather, you know, the high priestly prayer must be called as the Lord's prayer because there the Lord, it was the Lord who was praying on behalf of all of us John 17 uh, however you know however you call it I mean there's no issues even if you call it as the Lord's Prayer because that's how it was no known for centuries now but that's uh, just a side note for us to know now I remember learning this prayer when I was a young boy at school when I studied at St. Pius it was a privilege to study in a Catholic school and every day we would have the Lord's Prayer we would say the Lord's Prayer of course without understanding much what it meant and even when I went to the other school, even that was a Christian school, and we would say the Lord's Prayer in the assembly each day. So I learned this, uh, you know, uh, prayer as a very young boy. <clears throat> and my prayer, I didn't understand much when I 
prayed that prayer as a young boy but my prayer is that by the end of this series uh, our prayer life will be enriched by the help of the Holy Spirit as we go through this series amen now in chapter 6 verses 5 to 8 Jesus tells us how we must not pray okay he tells us how we must not pray and uh, he says we must not pray hypocritically you know that's what he emphasizes first of all and then he says we must not pray repetitively because some pagans thought that by reciting the things over and over and over again they can convince their gods and goddesses to listen to their prayers so Jesus is saying do not pray hypocritically don't show off as you pray and he also says don't pray repetitively like the pagans do then as he says that Jesus goes on to give the kind of prayer that's acceptable to God so in what context did the Lord give the prayer over here he's saying do not do not pray like this and then he's saying pray like this there is a way to prayer so he's giving us a pattern for prayer and in today's passage Jesus gives a model prayer to his disciples Jesus gives a model prayer to his disciples now church in the Christian faith three written documents are extremely vital the first one is the Apostles Creed in many of our Pentecostal churches we don't many of many Christians don't even know the Apostles Creed I think we need to correct that but if you go to many mainline churches and I've been to many mainline churches to preach uh, God's Word and they recite the Apostles Creed uh, almost every Sunday uh, because that kind of encapsulate what we believe so that's the first one Apostles Creed secondly the Ten Commandments that's the second written document which is vital and thirdly the Lord's Prayer for centuries Christians have been praying this Lord's Prayer the Apostles Creed tells us what we believe the Ten Commandments tell us how we must live and the Lord's Prayer tells us how to pray so that's why the, these three documents are very essential. It was interesting to learn, you know, every time I do in-depth study of God's word, there's always something to learn. We can never say that we know it all. You know, this prayer actually echoes a Jewish prayer known as the Kaddish. Kaddish, you know, there is a prayer which the Jews prayed. And when you look at some of the words, when you compare the words together, especially the initial part of the Lord's prayer, it's very similar so this was not totally new for the disciples altogether because Jesus you know basically used some of the material in a prayer called Jewish prayer called Kaddish so in this prayer first of all we see that you know Jesus taught us to invoke God's name our father in heaven right our father in heaven so that's what we're going to focus on this morning and after that there are six petitions in this particular prayer six petitions in verses 9 to 10 the first three petitions you know emphasize the preeminence of God the first three petitions emphasize the preeminence of God it says hallowed be thy name your kingdom come and your will be done three petitions regarding the preeminence of God then verses 11 to 13 in verses 11 to 13 there are uh, you know three petitions which focus on our personal needs three petitions which focus on our personal needs but again those personal needs are in the context of a community I'll explain more on that you know the Lord teaches us to pray for provision for pardon as well as for protection so that's what we see and and we're going to see these six six petitions in the next six sermons as we go forward some scholars say that this prayer is also eschatological meaning you know this prayer anticipates the kingdom of God you know and it anticipates that the kingdom of God will fully come because you know the Lord taught us to pray let your kingdom come your will be done so that has not happened completely yes God's kingdom is already inaugurated it has not yet fully come so as we pray this we are praying for God's kingdom to be established on this earth so in that sense it, it has a futuristic perspective as well though this prayer is brief it doesn't mean that we must always pray short prayers even in private you know some use this prayer and say you know prayers must be very short and of course we don't have to be long-winded 
you know as we pray as well so we need to uh, you know pray the exact point and close you know we need that sometimes even Jesus prayed all night as we see in Luke chapter 6 verse 12 he prayed all night prayers and that's why we uh, do all night prayers in many churches so this is basically a pattern that's what we need to understand so this morning uh, we're going to learn three lessons from the invocation in this prayer on the in the first phrase we are going to learn three lessons basically from the first phrase in the Lord's prayer what are those three lessons first of all we learn that we must pray in community we must pray in community Jesus says pray then like this our father in heaven and Ivy says this then is how you should pray for some reason there and you know ESV missed the word you the word you is again plural of course Je when Jesus is talking to his disciples talking to uh, disciples in plural and it is emphatic in Greek in other words you know Jesus is saying the hypocrites pray like this and the pagans pray like this but you you know he's, he's asking the disciples to be different from the rest of them he's saying you must not pray in the wrong way and Jesus is saying you must pray in this way so that's why the word you there is emphatic and the phrase pray then like this suggests that this prayer is a pattern or model Jesus did not say pray this prayer he says pray then like this in other words Jesus is saying that this is a pattern for prayer a model for prayer and also one more thing that we need to observe over here is this word pray is in present imperative which means it's a commandment first of all God is Jesus is commanding us to pray and it is in present tense which implies that it must be done continually okay so we must pray in this pattern continually it, it must not be stopped so it must be prayed continually that's what the Lord is saying now this prayer is also found in the Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 11 verses 2 to 4 uh, so this shows that Jesus probably taught this prayer at least on two different occasions now in this prayer in the in, in Matthew's gospel this prayer is given as a pattern for prayer but if you look at Luke's gospel Luke chapter 11 verses 2 to 4 this prayer is given as a form to pray in other words Jesus says pray this prayer exactly as it is you getting me so in Matthew's gospel it is more of a pattern to pray in Luke's gospel he's saying pray this prayer in Luke's gospel of course this prayer is shorter than Matthew's gospel also when you look at the context in Luke's gospel we see that Jesus gives this prayer in response to the disciples request the disciples asked Jesus Lord teach us to decide teach us to pray just as John's disciples were taught by John to pray so Jesus basically taught that in response to their request but here the context of course is different Jesus is talking about the wrong way of praying and the right way to pray now church today we can say this prayer as it is and in many churches of course you know they say this prayer as it is and we can also use this prayer as a pattern to share our needs with God so this is more of a pattern for us now while some Christians don't pray the Lord's Prayer regularly others pray it frequently almost every Sunday some people every day but they do it thoughtlessly I think both of them are wrong you know we must pray this prayer definitely frequently but we must also pray it you know by understanding thoughtfully we must pray you know we must not pray thoughtlessly but we must pray thoughtfully so the Lord's prayer must not be prayed ritualistically some people think that there is some power in this prayer and that's how some people say these prayers there is no inherent power as such you know but it is basically given as a pattern so that we can pray uh, and seek the Lord's face now I want you to observe something important here when you read Luke's gospel Jesus teaches his disciples to address God as father but what does Matthew say here how does it begin the, begin the Lord's prayer he says what our father our father now this prayer 
and this pattern of prayer could be said in our private prayer time but it is particularly it must be particularly used in corporate prayer as we address God together as our father our father so this prayer is particularly given for corporate prayers and sometimes you know we are so selfish in our prayers there was a man who often prayed lord bless me and my wife my son john and his wife us four and no more amen right that's how some prayers sound you know we just concentrate on ourselves and if there is an extended family probably we'll pray for them but we don't pray for the kingdom needs we don't pray for the nation for example we don't pray for the lost souls we don't pray for the government authorities we don't pray for unreached people groups we don't pray for the injustice that is happening in the society so you know we we, we must be kingdom minded and our prayers must change so we must not prayer is not just about you and your family alone we must learn to pray with one another and pray for one another right pray with one another and pray for one another so we when we don't participate in any of the corporate prayers we're missing out the opportunity of praying in community yes there is private prayer yes there is family prayer and is it is very important and i've talked about that on several occasions uh, that is important at the same time corporate prayers are also very important we must show our love and concern to our fellow brothers and sisters by praying for them and by praying with them. You know, if you say, I love your brother, and if you never pray for that brother, and that means that you don't love that person. So you show that love and concern by praying with them and praying for them. And also, please notice all the plural pronouns throughout the Lord's Prayer. It says, Our Father, give us. It doesn't say, give me and my family, right? give us our daily bread forgive us our sins lead us not into temptation so that means i'm 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 not supposed to be concerned about my own spiritual life but i'm i must be concerned about my fellow brothers and sisters spiritual life deliver us from evil right so you can see plural pronouns throughout so the lord's prayer reminds us that corporate prayers are very important in the life of the church if you are missing out on this you're missing out on something very significant very important if you think that this is not important if i pray uh, you know individually and as a family that's enough you're totally mistaken because new testament christianity is corporate in nature and new testament prayer is very much corporate in in nature we must pray together as a community we must pray together as a church and dear brothers brothers and sisters i want to encourage you to participate in the corporate prayers conducted in our church and i'll tell you there are very few churches which give such a number of avenues to pray you know we recognize the importance of prayer and we give the opportunity for you to pray not just for your needs we pray for our needs of course you know whoever gives the need we definitely pray for them we write it down and pray for them but we also pray for several other needs and god has given us so many opportunities to participate in the corporate prayers corporate prayers be it the intercessory prayers or the half night prayers or the prayer walk or the fasting prayers or of the women seeking the lord's face on wednesdays and having chain prayers there are umpteen number of opportunities that god is giving us and we must you know grab that opportunity and pray together we must understand that we cannot be godly christians in isolation and i spoke about this few months ago isn't it if you think that you know i live on an island with nobody to disturb me or or disturb my temper <laughs> you're mistaken because true godliness is possible only when you are with others when people insult you test you you know that's when our true godliness shows up so we need a community of believers and the lord's prayer teaches us that we must pray in community and i want to focus this morning especially on the second word that is mentioned over here as we pray together 
second lesson we must remember that god is a loving father as we pray together we must remember that god is a loving father jesus says pray like this pray then like this and he says a father in heaven and the central word over here is father of course now we know that jesus is god's son and thus jesus could address god as father but how can we address god as father now the question is can everyone address god as father the answer is no because not all the people are his children in a way all humans are god's offspring as act 17 28 and 29 says is all humans are god's offspring in a way but all do not have an intimate relationship with god as they are not saved so not everyone everyone in this world can go, call god as father that's why some are even referred to as the children of the devil in john 8:44 so there are some children of devil children of satan church we need to understand that we have a special relationship with god as we are adopted into his family john 1:12 says that he has given us the right to become the children of god hallelujah and uh, as we've seen on christmas day galatians chapter 4 verses 4 to 5 says that the purpose of christ incarnation the reason jesus came down to this earth is so that we can be adopted as god's sons amen just remember this if you are in christ you are never an orphan because our heavenly father himself is our father hallelujah our heavenly god himself is our father now when you re look at the word father in greek it is pater but jesus did not speak greek okay when he was on this earth he did not speak greek the most common language in those days was aramaic and in mark's gospel of course we see a lot of aramaic words talita kumi little one rise up and you know uh, you know so many other words uh, we see in mark's gospel especially the words that jesus speak in aramaic so jesus probably spoke in aramaic and the most likely word that he used over here as he taught his disciples originally was abba because that was a common term that jesus used and abba is of course an aramaic word which is an intimate term for father and jesus used that word elsewhere also as well now because of what christ has done on the cross even we call god as abba galatians 4 6 mentions that even romans 8 14 to 16 mention that as well so we also call god as abba now as we come to the lord's presence we can address him as abba father now what are the what are some of the implications of god's fatherhood so how does this uh, you know change our relationship with god now it's not there on the ppt but you can just jot down since god is a father he loves us deeply as his sons and daughters hallelujah since god is a father he loves us deeply as his sons and daughters the word father conveys a dependence on god we depend on god and since he is a father we must obey him and since he is a father you know we can have that intimate relationship with him just we must understand that in the first century children were totally powerless and they were totally dependent on their fathers to provide for them that's how we are when we come to our heavenly father we are totally weak and we are totally dependent on god to provide all of our needs and as god's children we don't have to keep repeating empty phrases as the pagans do Now, the pagans think that by keeping uh, by repeating the same thing over and over again they can somehow convince their gods but you know what the basis of our prayers is our relationship with god hallelujah you know he is our father and we are his children and that's why he answers our prayers he loves us deeply amen you know when you think about god's love apostle paul says in romans 8:38 and 39 for i am 
sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord hallelujah you know that's the love of God God is so committed to us that he's saying that nothing can separate us from God's love that's the love of the father and you know how our father is in the same gospel in Matthew chapter 7 verse 11 on the same Sermon on the Mount Jesus says if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him hallelujah so as we approach God we approach God with that perspective he is not a stingy God he is not a bad God he's a wonderful father and is willing to listen to our prayers and he's far greater than our earthly fathers. Amen. You know, many of us have good experiences with our earthly fathers. Some may not. And that is painful. I totally empathize with those who don't have that experience. You know, no matter how wonderful your earthly father is, God is far greater. He is infinitely greater and good than our earthly fathers. Praise the Lord. So friends, you know, since God is a father, he loves us deeply as his sons and daughters. Not only that, since God is a father, we are his heirs. We are his heirs. In the ancient days, rich people who didn't have children adopted a child to secure an heir for their property, basically. You see, some people go out of the way and help others but they don't make others a part of the family right you know we all help people in different ways but we don't say okay come and stay in my family i will feed you i will take care of your education everything no we don't do that we don't do that that easily but you know that's what exactly god has done for us we were often we were not his children we were not his people but he has adopted us and made us his sons and daughters amen Romans 8 17 says that since we are adopted as God's children now we are joined heirs with Christ amen so we have the same inheritance that Christ has so Galatians 4 7 says you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir through God are you getting me we are no longer slaves so once we are saved once we are born again we are no longer slaves but we are sons and if we are sons by implication Paul says you are an heir of God what a great privilege hallelujah so before we got saved we were slaves but now we are set free and we are sons the Bible says and since we are sons we are heirs and God's children inherit all of his promises through his son Jesus Christ and I love what Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 21 as well as 22. You know the Corinthians were basically fighting with one another. There was a lot of factions and divisions as you know. Some were saying we belong to Paul. Some were saying we belong to Apollo. Some were saying no we don't belong to any earthly you know pastors. We belong to Christ himself you know and so on. There were so many divisions. But, you know, Paul is saying, why are you guys, you know, fighting with, e with each other over these silly things? And he goes on to say that all things are yours. All things are yours. Because you are in Christ, all things are yours. When all things are yours, why in the world are you fighting about what is yours and what is not? Church, understand that implication. All things are yours. You are far richer than a Mukesh Ambani or a Bill Gates. If you believe that, say amen. Because we are joined heirs with Christ. All that belongs to Christ belongs to us. All that belongs to God, we have inherited because of Christ. So when we come to God and say, Our Father, you know, we need to recognize that we are joined heirs with Christ. Amen. Not only that, since God is a father, we will be completely liberated. 
we will be completely liberated let me explain this you, you see even the old testament portrays god as the father but it portrays god as the father of his chosen people israel it never uses the term father for individuals but it uses the word father for the nation of israel it is used 14 times in the old, old testament for israel and the term father is used for the first time in exodus chapter 4 verses 22 to 23 probably will quickly take a look at exodus 4 and verses 22 to 23 and this is what the Lord says then you shall say to Pharaoh thus says the Lord Israel is my firstborn son and I say to you let my son go that he may serve me if you refuse to let him go behold I will kill your firstborn son so in what context is you know God saying these words to Moses in the context of the deliverance of Israel right Israel were in Egypt and God is sending Moses and saying, you know, say these words to Pharaoh. Tell him that Israel is my firstborn son. And ask Pharaoh to let my people go. So the word father here is first of all used to refer to the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. Right? The Israelites were slaves. But God called Israel as his son. N.T. Wright, a scholar, says, in the same way, Jesus came to this earth to prepare us for the new exodus. You get me? In the Old Testament, they had an exodus from Egypt to the promised land. But Jesus came to this earth to prepare us for the new exodus. Very soon, church, we will be completely liberated from all our sufferings and we will be, you know, having a new exodus to the promised land hallelujah where heaven and earth join together and the kingdom of God will fully come on this earth praise the Lord so as we say father we are saying father I know that one day I'll be liberated from all my sufferings from all my pain amen the word father gives us tremendous hope not only that since God is a father the Holy Spirit dwells within us the Holy Spirit dwells within us since we are born of the Spirit the Spirit dwells within us that's what Galatians 4 6 says Paul says and because you are sons God has sent the Spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba Father since we are God's children God has sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts and now we cry out to the God, to the Lord and say Abba Father and as I mentioned on Christmas Day Church we have access to the same intimacy that Christ had with the Father hallelujah just as the Father cry you know Jesus cried out to the you know to God and said Abba Father we can cry out to God in the same with the same spirit and say Abba Father so the Holy Spirit dwells within us and as we see in Romans 8 26 the Holy Spirit helps us to intercede sometimes we don't know what to pray but praise God the Holy Spirit is within us and he helps us what to pray for and how to pray as well the Holy Spirit enriches our prayer life so when we call God as our father we must remember as well that we must remember that the Holy Spirit dwells within us so as we pray we must remember that God is a loving father Thirdly and finally as we pray together we must remember that God is the sovereign Lord we must remember that God is the sovereign Lord you know notice Jesus doesn't I mean Jesus doesn't just teach pray our father but he teaches our father in heaven now while the term father reminds us of the intimate relationship we have, we have with God, the phrase in heaven reminds us that our God is eternal, infinite and all powerful. Amen. Amen. We must remember that our God dwells in heaven. 
prayer can become boring or mechanical if we forget how great our God is. If you approach God as if he's just your buddy, you know, if you are not in awe of God, prayer will become mechanical. As Hebrews 12, 29 says, God is a consuming fire. So we must remember that God, you know, we have this father who is, with whom we have an intimate relationship. At the same time, we must remember that this God is glorious and awesome. So as we approach God, we must maintain this balance. We must approach him with love and devotion. And at the same time, we must go to his presence with awe, fear and trembling. So before you pray, take a moment to remember who God is. Don't just pray thoughtlessly. He is a loving father and a sovereign Lord. Hallelujah. So as we remember this, we will approach God with confidence on one hand and with humility on the other hand. Both are equally important as we approach God in prayer. Now, By the way, the word heaven doesn't mean that God can be contained in heaven, right? You know, when uh, the Bible uses the word heaven, it doesn't mean that God lives in heaven as such. Because God is spirit. And as Solomon prays in 1 Kings 8.27, even the highest heaven cannot contain him. Right? So even Isaiah 57 verse 15, if you can turn your Bibles to Isaiah 57 verse 15, this is what the Bible says. For thus says the Holy One who is high and lifted up, who, who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So God is high and lifted up. He dwells in the high and holy place, the Bible says. Just we must realize that God is, God is holy other, you know. Some theologians use the phrase holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other. In other words, how is God? Can you compare God with something? Though Bible compares God with 101 things, in, in reality we cannot compare God with anything at all. Because he is wholly other. He is a different kind of a being altogether. He is completely holy, far different from all of us. And sometimes we say that God is transcendent. In other words, he cannot be reached. J.I. Packer says that God exists on a different plane from us rather than in a different place. It's not that we live on earth and he lives in heaven. It's not just about the place. He lives in a different plane altogether. In other words, he's a different kind of a being altogether. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that this God dwells in unapproachable light. Church God deserves our utmost devotion and honor. Now think about this. This consuming fire, this God who cannot be reached by any human, this God who lives in unapproachable light is also willing to be our Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. It's amazing, isn't it? This awesome God is willing to listen to us as we communicate with Him in prayer. This glorious and awesome God is willing to have an intimate relationship with finite beings like you and I. That's totally amazing. This heavenly father doesn't have the weaknesses or limitations that our earthly fathers may have. God is the ideal and perfect father. Hallelujah. So God is all loving and all powerful as well. So as you approach God in prayer, remember that he is the loving father and at the same time remember that he is a sovereign Lord. So that's the main message that the Holy Spirit has for us this morning. As we pray together, let's remember that God is a loving father and the sovereign Lord. And let's pray together by the way, right? So we must pray together as a church. So as we pray together, Let's remember that God is a loving Father and the Sovereign Lord. 
let's maintain that balance let's not just see god as a pal as a friend as a buddy you know yes he 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 is willing to have an intimate relationship with us but let's not stop there at the same time we don't have to look at god you know with fear and trembling like the old testament people did you know as god revealed himself to moses on mount sinai people were so scared they said moses you go and talk to god we will not come you know we don't have to be afraid like that as the book of hebrews says we can approach the throne of grace boldly hallelujah yeah. that's because you know god accepts us as his sons and daughters so let's maintain that balance as we approach god on december 7th 1988 there was an earthquake in armenia in which 25000 people were killed it was a terrible terrible devastation and there was one small town in which just after the earthquake there was a father who rushed to the rushed to his son's school to see whether his son is still alive and the whole school was flattened because of the earthquake and there was no sign of life at all but he didn't want to go back home so he had often told his son that no matter what my son i will always be there for you when you need me now that's a commitment that this father made with his son so things looked hopeless no sounds you know no movement nothing everything is rubble you know everything is devastated and but then you know the father was so desperate to see his son that he began removing rubble from the place where he believed that the class uh, you know son's classroom was and there were so many other parents who came to that school and they were crying out my son my daughter but they were helpless they couldn't do anything but this father didn't keep quiet he kept removing the rubble and it, it was a huge pile people said you're wasting your time please go home there's no way we can you know say what children anymore they might have been dead they 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 probably were buried alive but then the father replied to them and said i made a son i made my son a promise that i'll be there whenever he needed me and he said i must continue to dig and he kept working alone nobody helped him but he kept working alone and he you know he simply had to know for himself he wanted to know is my boy alive or dead he was very keen to know that so he kept working beyond his natural strength he worked faithfully and he kept removing the rubble and he kept digging it went on for 8 hours and then for 12 hours and then for 24 hours and then for 36 hours and as he kept digging all alone after the 38th har as we took has he took away a heavy piece of rubble he heard voices and that dad cried cried out his son's name he says arman arman and then a child's voice responded dad it's me arman and then the young son said to his dad i told the other kids not to worry i told them that if you were alive you would save me and when you saved me you would save them as well you promised dad that you would always be there for me you did it dad that's what he said and a few moments later this dad helped his son arman then 13 more children who were hungry and scared to be rescued and they climbed out of that debris and they were free at last when the building collapsed these children thought they will not survive at all but you know through the courageous act of this one father they were saved and the whole town praised this one man's determination and grit and courage and he simply explained i promise my son no matter what i'll be there for you no matter what i'll be there for you you know what church 
no matter what our heavenly father will be there for you hallelujah and our heavenly father's love is far greater than the love of arman's father he has rescued us from sin and hell by sending his only son to die for us and what's more he is willing to grant us eternal life hallelujah did you receive this gift have you experienced the love of the heavenly father if not repent of your sins and surrender your life to jesus right today then you too will become a child of god church as you approach him in prayer remember that he is your loving father you know you don't have to be scared of anything you don't have to doubt about anything he loves you and he is for you amen he seeks your highest good you can never even have an iota of doubt that you know god is not for us no he is completely for us and as we approach god let's remember that he is the sovereign king over all the universe father in heaven he is the one who rules the entire universe all the galaxies all the stars and the whole creation so let let's approach god with confidence and awe amen our father in heaven shall we all stand to our feet and worship the lord